My name is Joshua Rapier, and for the last seven years, I have been an avid comic book collector, especially when it comes to superheroes, and I've spent these last seven years learning as much as I can about the history of these fictional yet amazing characters. We have all read the comics, watched the countless films and TV shows, and overall, the fantasy life of superheroes seems glamorous and heroic, and just like any good media, serves as wonderful escapist fiction. And yet, when you look deeper, you'll find not only do these superheroes deal with the same issues most people are uncomfortable with, but they have a powerful effect on those who view them, and that now within superheroes are safe from the social issues that plague reality. As a result of my love of comics, I have gained a large understanding of the groundbreaking series that changed the landscape of superhero comics and how people view them. From fun but nonsensical stories in the 50s to a strong, unique media in its own right with a deep history, both fictional and non-fictional. Starting from the 70s, comic writers have started focusing their attention on problems society frequently face, starting off with the dangers of illegal drugs and then eventually tackling a slew of topics that trouble society and even discouraging those who persecute people with different sexuality or nationality by creating more LGBT and diverse characters outside of original cliché that all superheroes were good-looking, straight white American men. These characters have allowed for great social commentary within the comic book pages and are a prime example of how the world views have changed in the last 80 years. So today, I want to give a brief history lesson on the comics, writers and landmark issues that have changed the landscape of comic books and helped define the themes and characters we have previously discussed. And by the end of it, I'll answer the questions, are these comics relevant and do they even help the world views? So, now that all that is set, it's time we start this history lesson properly by beginning at the very start of the superhero genre, the Golden Age. Both Marvel and DC Comics first debuted during the late 30s, both under different names, and it would take several years later before the iconic characters such as Superman and Captain America would appear, beginning the tidal wave of superheroes. Although the core premise of costume heroes fighting villains was there from the very beginning, and has still remained to this day, in the 30s to 50s comics, there was a complete lack of fantastic artwork writing and social commentary that made comic books the juggernaut medium it is today. The premise of each issue and series was simple and entertaining. Most writers of the time barely considered putting too much effort or force into the series, hence why there was a total lack of layered characters and meaningful situations. In fact, looking back at these comics, you will see a grim reminder of race present back then through the vile imagery used to represent other races. There are very few black characters in comics during the Golden Age, and those who did exist have become very infamous. Such is the case with Ebony White, the sidekick to the spirit, and the only black character ever appear in the timely era of Marvel Comics, Whitewash. Both characters are drawn in disturbing similar styles of racial blackface characters, popular through the Jim Crow era and poorly written. So, aside from a few stories of characters dealing with child abuse and working conditions of minors, I believe the closest to the Golden Age comics had social significance was during World War II. When a second world war broke out in 1939, and the premise of battling mad scientists no longer seemed relevant, it proved as a chance for superheroes to fight the greatest evil of that time, or at least on paper. The early 40s became popular for presenting bold covers and stories of superheroes such as the original Human Torch Neymar battling Nazis and defending America. Some heroes were created purely to fight the Nazis and their allies. While some of these specially created heroes have now faded in obscurity, such as the Destroyer and the Shield, others have become iconic characters in the world of comics and remain popular and sometimes relevant to this day. Such is the case with Wonder Woman and of course, Captain America, whose number one cover portrays the hero punching Hitler and this was nine months before Pearl Harbor before America became truly active in the war. And when the heroes were not fighting the Axis infiltrators, they were used as very memorable propaganda, urging readers to buy war bonds and stamps, throw a victory garden, and do their bit in the war. Although it's not been definitively proven, some historians claim these comic books were incredible morality boosters during those times, for the brave men fighting across the sea and the scared children waiting at home. Records show by the time the war started, 15 million comics were sold per month, and in 1947, 
Superior comics were being sold 60 million per month. And the single largest customer during that time was the United States Army. So there was no denying the popularity they had at the time. The adventure filled comics were cheap, easy to carry, and served as an entertaining distraction and mental escape from the soldiers. And at times, maybe even inspiration. So World War II was the first time comics and the genre of superheroes gained true popularity and relevancy and many saw characters like Superman with the ideals of truth, justice and the American way as symbols of America. Yet, sadly when the war finally came to a close, both the sales and qualities of the comics took a severe drop. Many believe that the Comic Code Authority was born from the ideology of Frederick Wortham writer of 1954's anti-comic book, Seduction of the Innocent, a now infamous book that claimed comic books were an evil form of literature that not only glorified violence and homosexuality, but also encouraged them, apparently leading young viewers to juvenile delinquency and earning disturbed minds. Well, now the book is rightfully criticised for exaggerating violence in comics and giving readers bad, even incomplete information, at time of its release, it was a massive blow to the comic industry due to many parents being alarmed by what they read, going as far as the host comic book burnings. This widespread overreaction led to Senate hearings in 1954 on the potential impact comic books had on juvenile delinquency. Due to unfortunate results, in 1954 the Comics Magazine Association of America created a Comic Code of 40 that allowed the major comic publishers to self-regulate and censor the content of comic books. By the end of the year, Every single series hosted a Comic Code logo, ensuring parents that their child was reading a non-violent comic. The code had many rules against showing types of violence or horror. While nowadays, public opinion to Comic Code is negative, I think it had some benefits. For example, a lot of the pointless, violent and racist imagery was cut. But there's no ignoring the Comic Code essentially ruined the creativity and store of the writers and comics of the many rules forcing super comics to leave the dark, crime-fighting roots. Some publishers like Timely started focusing more on sci-fi and romance comics, and for a while, even cancelled the series with beloved classic superhero. DC managed to continue their superhero range, most likely thanks to the popularity of the Superman radio and TV show, but in order to play it safe and stick to the many rules of the CCA, writers forced their characters to leave their mature route and become more far-fetched than ever before with stories ranging from campy, melodramatic, to laughably ridiculous. So, with the CCA and overprotective parents breathing down the backs of the writers, they were unable to make many mature stories. And while not all comic books were bad during that time, the fact of the matter is, nothing socially relevant or groundbreaking happened in comics during the 50s. Fortunately though, the next decade would bring with it new stories that helped redefine the superhero genre and paved the way for socially relevant stories. Starting off innocently enough, by the end of that decade, the genre of superheroes was more popular than ever been thanks to both the popularity of the campy 60s Batman TV series and the talent of Marvel writer and artist Stanley and Jack Kirby, who near the start of the decade created a new generation of superheroes, starting off with the Fantastic Four, whose popularity quickly led to the creation of Spider-Man, Iron Man, Hulk, the Avengers, and many more. What made these characters different and more popular from the past was that there was a focus on their lives outside of being superheroes, allowing for more realistic situations to happen, making the lives of the characters more dramatic and relatable to the audience, with even magazine polls showing the students admired characters like Spider-Man and Hulk for being outsiders. Not only did this new style of writing and stories become popular enough for Lee and Kirby to bring back Marvel's original heroes like Namor and Captain America, but it also led to writers and companies like DC fleshing out their characters. However, just as these series were defining moment in comic book history, in the same decade, a man, his beliefs, and iconic speech became a defining landmark in the American Civil Rights Movement. In 1963, Martin Luther King's junior speech about freedom and equality for all African Americans shook the country and helped start the end of racism. And weren't superheroes meant to be a symbol of freedom? With society changing and a world of comics becoming more realistic, 
Marvel was daring enough to break new ground and created the world's first black superhero, the Black Panther. First appearing in Fantastic Four 52 and 53 in 1966, the Black Panther, also known as T'Challa, was an African king taking on the mantle of Black Panther to fight criminals and other injustice. His debut story was suitably dramatic, single handedly taking out the Fantastic Four to test his skills before taking revenge on the man who killed his father. Well, not the first black of the two comics, with little known company Gale Comics created Lobo in 1965, a western series with the first African American main character, and Marvel having several black supporting characters such as Spider Man regular Joe Robertson. Black Panther stands out being the first true black superhero and possessing a calm, regal personality, contrasting against most black characters having a rock'em sock'em attitude. Following the arrival of Black Panther, several years later came Sam Wilson, the Falcon, the first African American superhero and partner to Captain America. Both characters have been applauded for launching a wave of more diverse characters in superhero comics. While the introductions of these two characters are perhaps the most important debut in that decade, one comic book series would have an unsuspecting start, yet has since involved in becoming a beloved series ripe with metaphors and allegories of real life social issues. And this series was the X-Men. This series was about teenagers who gained powers and fought to save a world that hate and feared them. The original five members fought not only the usual comic book supervillains, but riots and bigots. Creator Stan Lee intended for the X-Men to be a comic book representation of puberty, of children experiencing changes and seeing a world in a different, more crueler way. However, it is easy to see that the series could also be an allegory for racism. The series never truly found its footing at first, and it was cancelled after issue 66 in 1970. However, thankfully the series was revived in 1975 with a new, more racially diverse cast and writer Chris Claremont, a popular writer of the series, who had a strong focus on characterization and had darker themes and grand storylines. Nowadays, the X-Men are considered to be allegories of justice against minorities and homosexuals, and several plot elements serve as parallels to real life events and people, such as genocide, the Holocaust, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Christianity, lynch mobs, the KKK, and through the fictional legacy virus, the X-Men series had a stand-in for AIDS, making the X-Men a very sophisticated series. So, with all this, the late 60s marked the end of silly over-the-top stories, leading to perhaps the most popular era in comics, the Bronze Age. The 1970s marked the beginning of the Bronze Age for Marvel and DC, with their plots gaining dark elements and launched the start of truly socially relevant storylines such as racism, urban poverty and anti-drug use. It was the introduction of Danger of Drugs in comics that served as a game changer of that decade. With President Nixon branding illegal drugs as public enemy at number one, it only seemed natural for the comic industry to get involved. At least, that's what the Department of Health thought. In a rarely preceded event, a representative from the government agency contacted longtime Marvel editor and writer Stan Lee for a letter early in 1970. Stan would later say it was something like Realising the influence your character Spider-Man has on people, we think it would be very beneficial if you were to do an anti-drug story in Spider-Man. The result of this would come out as famous Spider-Man story arc, Green Goblin Reborn, starting with issue 96 in 1971, the first story arc in any superhero comic to openly condemn the use of drugs. The story started with Spider-Man saving this man stoned out of his mind from falling off a roof only that they to find out his best friend Harry Osborn had a severe drug addiction. The story arc had a mix of exciting action of Spider-Man facing his enemy Green Goblin, and social commentary spliced with emotion when it came to Peter helping his friend battle his addiction. Meanwhile, over at DC, writer Denny O'Neill and artist Neil Adams were going to the next level for their title, Green Lantern and Green Arrow, an acclaimed series that had a petty origins. As the sales of both characters' own series were low, both series were merged into one, only because they had a similar name. Seeing that they had nothing to lose, Denny O'Neill took the series into an unexpected direction, with his thinking being, what if we plotted the stories from the headline, 
What if we did the stuff that as US citizens and veterans and fathers we were really concerned about? With Dennis O'Neill's gritty style of writing and journalistic experience matched with Neil Adams' near realistic artwork, the series was a critical success. With the theme of the series being the two heroes trying to find America to land where the land of the free has become the land of the fearful, and show the heroes traversing across the country. During this run, writer and artist tackled most of the topics they felt passionate about, except the issue of drug abuse, a topic Adam wanted to explore. The result of this was the iconic two-part storyline, Snowbirds Don't Fly, starting in Green Lantern and Green Arrow e issue 85 in summer 1971. A gritty story that involved Green Arrow finding out his longtime psychic was addicted to heroin and involved in a drug ring. The following issue had Green Arrow guiding his friend to withdrawal. The story arc is fairly similar to that of the anti-drug story in Amazing Spider-Man. However, Snowbirds Don't Fly boasted a far more gripping, emotional story matched with powerful cover art. Both Goblin Reborn and Snowbirds Don't Fly are praised nowadays as starting to trend anti-drug stories that unlike ad campaigns at the time didn't simply tell you not to do drugs, but produced epic stories that younger viewers could enjoy and learn the dangers of drugs at the same time. However, there was one final hurdle both stories had to overthrow before being published, the Comet Code, which rejected both stories due to mention of drugs, despite it being an anti-drug story. This left both stories in limbo for a while. However, Stanley and publisher Martin Goodman felt so strongly about the Spider-Man story, they decided to do something that had been done for nearly two decades, publish the story without the Comet Code Authority. The success of this story led to the Comics Code Authority becoming more lenient in their restrictions in the area of narcotics, sexual situations, and for some reason, monsters. This ironically led to a Stan Lee once joke, the distinguished competition, finally being able to release their own anti-drug story. The success of both stories led to bigger, grittier, and socially relevant stories and characters. It also started a defeat of the Comic Code, whose grip was lessening each year until it lost any purpose finally giving the writers full creative control. The modern era, also known as the Dark Age of comic books, continues and improves upon the elements that made the Bronze Age such massive hits. Once the topic of drug abuse led to acclaimed stories, there was no turning back. Any topic that had potential and the writers felt passionate about was adapted into their respective comic universes. Meanwhile, over at DC, PSA comics were particularly popular during the 90s and early 2000s and were a lot darker and more grippy than what Marvel would have been doing. The themes of these stories range from anti-sexual abuse, world hunger, dangers of landmine, guns and feminine. However, in 1992, a single issue of Alpha Flight is far more significant than any of those well-intentioned PSA comics. In Alpha Flight issue 106, Writer of the series, Scott Lobdell, was finally given permission to let a character named Northstar say the important words. I am gay, thus becoming the first openly homosexual superhero in comics. Although there had been hints of Northstar's sexuality in the past by several writers, there had been no actual confirmation until now. The reason it had taken so long for this to happen was due to the no openly gay characters policy of then Marvel editor Jim Shooter and a comic code authority. Scott Lobdell broke this rule in order to bring attention to the HIV and AIDS epidemic. Despite never being a popular series, this single issue sold out in a week and royalties were donated to Lesbeth Glazer Periodic AIDS Foundation. Just like the introduction of Black Panther decades before, the introduction of a homosexual character launched a wave of LGBT characters. Examples of these modern times characters are long-time Marvel teenage couple Hulkling and Wiccan and DC's Apollo and the Midnighter and characters such as original Green Lantern Alan Scott, Batwoman Kathy Kane, and original X-Men member Iceman who were created in the 40s to 60s, a very homophobic time, 
having retconned as homosexual characters, allowing them more character development than they ever had in the past. This has allowed for more emotional complex stories and social commentary. And in 2012, following President Obama's revealing his agreement with same-sex marriage, it seemed very fitting that North Star and his boyfriend Kyle would have the first official marriage of a gay couple in Marvel Comics in a wedding dedicated issue, Astonishing X-Men issue 51. Batwoman is now the first lesbian superhero to own her own series, which won critical acclaim, and in Batgirl issue 19, a supporting character and friend of Batgirl revealed herself to be transgender, the first openly transgender character in a mainstream comic, and will later in issue 45, have the first transsexual wedding in DC. Even non-superhero comic series, Archie Comics, created news headlines by introducing the first gay character in the series, Kevin Keller in 2010. Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamination then President Jarrett Barrios praised Kevin's creation. It's thrilling to see Riverdale's High welcome its first openly gay character and give students a window into lives of gay youth today. As images of gay and transgender people come more frequent on the TV and in film, people are embracing and expecting to see images of our community across media platforms, including comic books. Well, there are so many series and topics I wish I could tell you about. I can't, because there's simply too much to talk about in one video. But, before we end, I feel it's important to discuss the most latest landmark characters in the superhero industry. DC's Green Lantern Simon Baz and Marvel's Miss Marvel Kamala Khan, the most popular Muslim superheroes. Well, not the first Muslim characters to appear in comic books. For example, in 1994 and 2003, Marvel created M and Dust, two X-Men members who are both female Muslim characters who are conceived to explore anti-Muslim hate. Simon Baz and Miss Marvel have gained more media attention and a bigger fan following due to their strong characterizations and taking on the mantles of superhero names that originally belonged to white American characters. Both characters dealt with the anti-Muslim hatred of a post-9-11 world and struggled with the unfair label society gives them. Well, not intentional, I feel like both characters are different sides of the same coin, with Baz's stories being more gritty and even cynical and Miss Marvel's more optimistic stories being that of an Arabic girl juggling growing up in New York and being a superhero. Both characters in the title share common ground for not only confronting supervillains, but also explores the conflicts of the home life and religious duties. While there have been some harsh comments on these characters, particularly on Simon Baz, who has more than once been criticised by critics as a one-dimensional throwback to the edgy 90s, and Miss Marvel's titles reinforce the stereotype of restrictive Muslim families, Overall, the response to these characters have been fantastic, with mass praise to their believable characterizations and valuable social insights into a culture not really talked about in comics. Miss Marvel has even achieved cultural impact in the real world, with people spray painting her image on anti Islamic posters. And even more impressively, President Barack Obama praised the character and her creator, Sama Anamat, at a reception for Women's History Month in the White House. In his opening remarks, Obama replied, Miss Marvel may be your comic book creation, but I think for a lot of young boys and girls, Sana is a real superhero. Many are hoping these characters work in their purpose to improve the portrayals of Muslim characters in comics, to change the negative opinion of that culture, and it's possible these two characters will launch a wave for more Islamic characters, just like Black Panther and North Star did for the African American and homosexual characters. It's been nearly 80 years since Superman first appeared on those magazine racks in 1938, marking a true birth of the superhero comic industry. A lot of things have changed at that time, not just for the comic industry, but for our world as well. And I feel it's very impressive how superheroes has been there one way or another. They were there for us in World War II. They joined the fight against drugs and other crimes, and through the powerfully emotional Amazing Spider-Man issue 36, they assisted us through the tragedy of 9-11 with these comics serving as a heartfelt tribute to those who lost their lives and a fireman and police officers who risked theirs to save others. After nearly half a century of simplistic plots and characters, we get epic, long-lasting storylines, layered characters, and right now, we currently have beloved titles like Miss Marvel's The Champion, encouraging everyone to actively engage the world. With mature stories, blockbuster movies, and famous names like Joss Whedon and Barack Obama writing and expressing their love for comics, the world has realised that comics are not just for children. Some of you have been caught old stories I've mentioned as stories made as publicity stunts, 
motivated by political correctness and social trends, and while it's a case of a few ideas, it's not so for every groundbreaking story, and even if it is, that should not affect how people love these stories. These stories were made by people passionate about these topics, and wish to let the world know more about them through the eyes of beloved characters. Because children love and respect superheroes, and that love can stick to them for the rest of their lives. And by sticking with these characters and their fun yet sophisticated stories, they are more than likely to learn the important morals and social issues writers have woven into the series, or still making it work with the rest of the story and not bluntly saying out loud just for the sake of it. And with that, the popular idea of comics being just for children has changed, and with such huge variety in topics, setting, tone styles and characters, anyone and everyone can love a superhero series for try it. So by now, hopefully you've got my point and gained a larger understanding and appreciation of comics and the superhero industry. And if you're interested in reading these comics, then please do it! There is a literal universe worth of content to explore that shows no sign of stopping anytime soon. And whatever happens to the world in the future, you can be rest assured that somehow our favourite superheroes will be there with us.